Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we will start a new module where we will look into rotational spectroscopy in detail. So, as we have already discussed before, we can have rotational spectroscopy in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, let us look into the electromagnetic spectrum again. So, this is the microwave region. So, the frequency range for the microwave electromagnetic region is from 1000 megahertz to 300,000 megahertz. And we know that 1 megahertz equals 10 to the power 6 hertz. So, roughly speaking, so the microwave region falls between 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 12 hertz and in this uh, electromagnetic spectrum, the frequency is increasing towards the left. And as we have also discussed before, for this different transitions like electronic, rotational, vibrational. So, the delta E electronic is much greater than delta E vibrational, which is much greater than delta E rotational. So, if we draw the energy levels, let us say we have this electronic energy levels E electronic. So, this is my delta E electronic. So, for each electronic energy level, we have these different vibrational energy levels. This is E vibrational. So, a transition here, the energy difference is delta E vibrational. And for each vibrational level, there are different rotational levels. So, this is delta E rotational and we are plotting here the rotational levels. So, because today we are talking about rotation or rotational spectroscopy, let us consider a rotating rigid body. The classical mechanics of rotational motion of a rigid body is relatively complicated. So, it is useful to note the extensive correspondence between a linear motion and the angular motion or the rotational motion of a point particle of mass m. So, let us consider this particle of mass m is rotating in a circle of radius r. So, for a small displacement x from any point on the circle, we can assume this small segment is linear. That is, although this is linear, it is part of the circumference of the circle. So, we can write sin theta equals x by r. So, because we have considered this displacement to be very small. So, the theta actually is also very small and because the theta is small, we can write sin theta is approximately equal to theta. So, because sin theta is approximately equal to theta, we can write theta equals x by r. So, here r is a constant as the particle is rotating 
in a circle of constant radius. However, x is a variable and so is theta. So, thus we can think the distance in linear motion is analogous to the angle swept out by the particle in angular or rotational motion. And we also know any linear motion is associated with a linear velocity v which is given by x dot that is d x d t. So, for angular motion similarly we have a velocity which is known as angular velocity which is denoted by omega and omega is given by as we see from the analogy from the linear motion omega is given by theta dot that is d theta d t. So, because theta is x by r we can write omega equals d of x by r d t and as I have already mentioned the particle of mass m is rotating in a circle of constant radius. So, r is a constant. So, we can write 1 by r d x d t and this d x d t is the velocity. There is a linear velocity. So, we can write omega equals v by r. So, we can think this angular velocity as the number of radians of angle swept out in unit time by a rotating system. So, we can also calculate that for a particle moving with a linear velocity v, the frequency nu or how many revolutions of circumference 2 pi r that is the circumference of the circle with radius r is completed per unit time. So, nu is v by 2 pi r and as for every revolution it sweeps out an angle of 2 pi or in other words we know that omega equals 2 pi nu. So, we can write omega equals 2 pi and nu is v by 2 pi r. So, we can again show that omega equals v by r. So, as a linearly moving body has linear momentum given by p, p equals m v. A rotating body has also a momentum known as the angular momentum which is denoted by L. So, we can see L is given by R cross P. So, if R and P are in the same direction, then the cross product becomes 0. So, L becomes 0. Otherwise, L exists. So, for a single particle as shown here in this figure, we can see the omega and L are vectors that point out of the plane of rotation. However, we should remember that if an extended object is rotating, this omega and L need not point in the same direction. And so, in general, L is related to omega with the relation L equals i omega. So, here we see this angular momentum L and the angular velocity omega are vectors. So, if they are in the same direction as we see in this figure where single particle of mass m is rotating, then i is a scalar quantity. But in general, they are not in the same direction as mentioned for this extended object 
for example, a molecule. So, I is defined as a tensor and I is known as the moment of inertia. So, this tensor is represented by a matrix. So, if we consider a three dimensional space, it is a three by three matrix. In other words, in a three by three matrix, we have nine components. So, we can write L equals I, which is a tensor, omega is a vector. In three dimensional space, we can write L as L x, L y, L z equals I is a 3 by 3 matrix that is I x x, I x y, I x z, I y x, I y y, I y z, I z x, I z y, I z c and then the angular velocity which is also a vector we can write omega x, omega y, omega c. So, in a three dimensional space we can represent L equals i omega this way. So, now let us go back to a single particle rotating in a circle. So, L equals R cross P. So, P we know is P is given by P equals m v. So, we can write that is R cross m v, we can write this as m r cross v and because r and v are perpendicular. So, we can write L equals m v r and as we know v by r equals omega or v equals r omega, we can write L equals m omega r squared. So, if we compare this expression that is L equals m r squared omega with the other expression that is L equals i omega. So, we can see the analogy that i equals m r square and also L is the angular momentum and P is the linear momentum. So, we see that P equals m v, so linear momentum and is the linear velocity. So, we have angular momentum L, we have angular velocity omega. So, comparing this p equals m v with L equals i omega, grossly we can think what mass is for linear motion, moment of inertia is for rotational motion. So, now moving back to polyatomic molecules. So, diatomic molecules are the easiest examples of polyatomic molecules. So, let us start with diatomic molecules and also Although the diatomic molecules undergo simultaneous rotation and vibration, let us just consider the rotational effects for now. So, this is known as the rigid rotor approximation. So, we will first consider diatomic rigid rotors, which means the bond length is not changing, just the molecule is rotating. So, for a diatomic molecule, 
with masses m 1 and m 2 and bond length r and such that m 1 is r 1 distance away from the center of mass and m 2 is r 2 distance away from the center of mass. So, if this molecule is rotating and because both the atoms are rotating with constant angular velocity omega. So, we can write L equals m 1 r 1 square omega plus m 2 r 2 square omega that is m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared omega. So, if we compare this expression with L equals i omega. So, we can get or we can see that i equals m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared. So, when we were talking about a single rotating particle, we saw i is m r square where mass where m was the mass of the particle. And when we have a diatomic molecule with masses m 1 and m 2, then i is m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared. So, in general the expression of i for a polyatomic molecule is i equals summation i m i r i squared where r i is the distance of the ith particle of mass m i from the center of mass of the system. So, after we have considered the angular momentum L, let us now consider the energy of a rotating diatomic rigid rotor. So, a rotating molecule has no potential energy. So, normally energy is given by the sum of kinetic energy plus potential energy. In this particular case, the potential energy is 0. So, the energy or the total energy comes only from the kinetic energy. So, thus we can write E equals half m 1 v 1 squared plus half m 2 v 2 squared and putting the value of v we can write half m 1 r 1 squared omega squared plus half m 2 r 2 squared omega squared. So, that is half m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared omega squared. And as we know this m 1 r 1 squared plus m 2 r 2 squared is nothing but the moment of inertia i. So, the energy becomes half i omega squared. So, now let us look into this expression and the analogy from the linear motion. For linear motion the kinetic energy is given by equals half m v squared. So, as we saw the analogous uh, part of mass in linear motion is moment of inertia in the rotational motion and here we have linear velocity, here we have angular velocity. So, half m v squared in linear motion it is half i omega squared in angular motion. So, we can write this half i omega squared as half i squared omega squared by i that is half i omega whole squared by i. So, we know i omega is the angular momentum L. So, this energy expression becomes L squared by 2 i. Again 
we know in linear motion the linear momentum p so energy or the kinetic energy is related to p by p square by 2m so here the kinetic energy in the rotational motion is related to the angular momentum by l square by 2i so now let us move on to quantum mechanics although a complete quantum mechanical description can be obtained by solving the schrodinger equation for a rotating linear system at first it is more informative to see what is obtained by applying bohr's condition that the angular momentum is quantized we know the angular momentum is quantized in the units of h cross that is h by 2 pi so the quantized angular momentum condition requires l that is angular momentum is j h cross where j is the rotational quantum number and j can take values like 1 2 3 so we can write l equals j h cross as l equals root over j times j times h cross but the correct quantum mechanical treatment however gives if j is an integral quantum number the angular momentum l is given by not as square root of j square h cross but root over j into j plus 1 h cross so we can see that energy which is given by l squared by 2 i we can write as root over j times j plus 1 squared h cross squared by 2 i that is h cross squared by 2 i j times j plus 1 and because h cross is h by 2 pi so we can write this as h square by 8 pi squared i j times j plus 1 so we can obtain the same expression of energy that is e equals h square by 8 pi square i times j times j plus 1 by solving the Schrodinger equation. So, because j is the rotational quantum number, we see that as the value of j increases, the energy increases. So, if we go from 0 to 1 to 2 to j equals 3, the energy of this rotating particle or the rotating molecule will increase. So, when j equals 0, then the energy expression becomes 0 or as if the molecule is not rotating. So, now if we look into the angular momentum expression, we see the angular momentum increases with increasing j. So, what does it mean? Angular momentum is given by i omega and i is nothing but related to the masses of the atoms and the distance or the radius r which is constant for a rotational motion. So, that will not change. So, if I change j what will change is the angular velocity. So, what we might think is as we have increase in j or increase in the value of j the molecule will start rotating in a like a larger velocity larger angular velocity. So, before we end this lecture let us look back to the correspondence between the linear motion and the angular motion. So, if we want to define position in linear motion it is defined in terms of distance that is x 
in angular motion it is defined in terms of angle that is given by theta. In linear motion there is a linear velocity which is given by v that is x star that is d x d t. In angular motion there is an angular velocity omega that is given by theta dot that is d theta d t and we saw that omega equals v by r. The mass for a linear motion is the mass m. The analogous thing in the angular motion is the moment of inertia. So, the momentum or the linear momentum for linear motion is p equals m v. With this correspondence, we can say the angular momentum l equals what is equivalent to mass that is i and what is equivalent to linear velocity is linear motion and angular motion we have angular velocity. So, l equals i omega. Similarly, for kinetic energy the expression is half m v squared or p squared by 2 m and in angular motion we have to write half i angular velocity squared or angular momentum squared by 2 